Well, good evening. I appreciate you guys showing up. I hate talking to myself, but I have kind of an alarming announcement, though. For the first time in my entire life, I'm really starting to doubt the existence of God. I had to find somewhere to eat in the area before coming here, and I did a search. And I, was, I was looking for Chick-fil-A and didn't find one, so I ate at Qdoba. And then I drive here, and I drive right by a Chick-fil-A. So how can there be a God if he didn't let me go to Chick-fil-A? I'm not quite sure. i got to wrestle with that one. But I'm glad you're here. Um, sometimes I open these talks by saying, tonight we're going to talk about dinosaurs, but we're not going to talk about dinosaurs. What does that mean? Yes, we will discuss dinosaurs, but the main point isn't dinosaurs. The main point is, can you really trust the Bible? That's what we're going to be focusing on. We're going to use the topic of dinosaurs to address that question. And you're going to ask yourself, do you really trust the Bible or do you go somewhere else for information and take that and then use that to go into God's Word to figure out what He actually meant? Like, I've learned this and this and that about dinosaurs or about the Big Bang or about evolution or about whatever. And now that I know that, when I read the Bible, I can figure out what it actually means. Because it, it can't mean what it says because we know better now. We've learned so many things from astrophysics and from geology and biology and all that. Now we know better. The Bible can't mean what it says because it was written a long time ago and it's outdated and on and on and on. So do we go somewhere else for our source of authority or do we start with God's Word? If the Bible truly is the inspired Word of God and it claims to be, that should be our starting point for everything. And so that's kind of the backdrop I'm going to give you. The talk I'm giving you is a partial talk of a three or four, I think it's a three-part series on dinosaurs that I have on. This, this is called a DVD. <laughs> this is, I've been told already, old school. So I might as well say this now so I don't forget later. We got a bunch of DVDs out there. There are 22 video sessions on the DVDs. All the sessions are also streamable. That's keep, keeping up to date. So everything can be streamed. Next week, we haven't gone official with this yet. You'll find out about it first. Next week, we are announcing we are getting rid of all of our DVDs and all of our streaming is going to be free. So we have 22 right now. I'm making 25 to 30 more. They will all be free, streamable. Watch them anytime, anywhere. So if you sign up on our newsletter, you'll get that announcement and you'll get the information on how do you get access to all the free videos, including what you're going to see tonight and the expanded version, the whole thing. So uh, part of my talk, I will go over my background. Many of you know me fairly well. The rest of you are fortunate to not know me. But <clears throat> I'll go my background really quickly. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home, and you can clearly see that that is a Christian home. <laughs> and uh, I went to public schools all the way through high school. I, actually, I live in Waukesha. <laughs> um, someone's got to live there. So I was born there, still live there. I haven't been able to escape, but I graduated from Waukesha North. Then I went to a Christian university, John Brown University in Arkansas, to study mechanical engineering. I got a degree there, but then became more interested in physics. John Brown didn't have a physics major, so I had left Arkansas. I came back to Wisconsin and went to UW-Whitewater to get a degree in physics. And that's when my world changed quite a bit. Going from a small Christian college where all my engineering professors opened up every class in prayer. That was awesome. And I got to Whitewater, and my physics professors did not open up in prayer. I'd, maybe they forgot, I don't know. <laughs> um, but they were all evolutionists, and some of them were atheists. And they were telling me that everything I believed was wrong. And that made me very uncomfortable to be surrounded by those PhD scientists who I assumed that they had a lot of evidence for what they believed. But I realized for the first time in my entire life that even though I know what I believed, I did not know why. I could not defend the Christian worldview. So God put it on my heart to start looking into things. So I've been looking into things and lecturing for 38 years now. <laughs> Time just kind of flies. And uh, about 17 years ago, I felt called into full-time ministry doing this. I founded the Starting Point Project. Everyone starts somewhere with their belief systems. It's impossible to not start somewhere. You've know, you got to start somewhere. So Christians start with the belief that God exists and the Bible is the Word of God. And we use that starting point to define everything else. What science and logic are, ethics, morality, philosophy, all those things are defined by our starting point. 
Skeptic would have a different starting point. You can ask them, what's your starting point? Probably don't even realize they have one. But if they think it through, they can tell you what it is. And you can ask them, oh, what made you choose that as a starting point? And why are you confident that that starting point will help you accurately understand everything that's going on around you? You get into these really nice, wholesome conversations rather than just arguing with people. So that's why we're the starting point project. Along the way, I was also invited to be on the board of directors of a group called Logos Research Associates. Really quickly, this is not a group called BioLogos. Two totally different groups. BioLogos is a group of people claiming to be Christians. I, I'm not doubting that. Uh, but they're pushing evolution big time. And they have millions and millions of dollars of grant money uh, to be getting into the churches, into the seminaries, into Christian schools, and everything pushing evolution. That's BioLogos. Uh, this is a different group called Logos Research Associates. This is the world's largest consortium of scientists who are Christians and creationists. And so I was invited to be on the board, the founding member, Dr. John Sanford. He's from Cornell University. He's worldwide famous for having invented the gene gun. It inserts genes into the DNA. Brilliant scientist, uh, but very strong Christian and creationist and very humble man. And then there's Dr. John Baumgartner. He's a PhD geophysicist. He just happened to build the world's best 3D computer simulation of plate tectonics. <laughs> just off the charts brilliant. Even secular geologists use that model. And then there are three other board members and myself. Um, as smart as these guys are, and they are brilliant, if they were here this evening, they would be the first to admit, out of all six board members, I am the tallest. <laughs> so <laughs> I am pretty proud of that. <laughs> Actually, just two months ago, they voted to have me become president. So I have lost all respect for them now, but now I'm president of this group. So, but it's just cool hanging around them because they are literally doing cutting edge science and then I get to take that and convert it into something called English <laughs> so that other people could understand it as well. So, you didn't come here to hear that. We're gonna talk about dinosaurs and the Bible here. Very, very interesting. And I have a quiz for you before we go any further. Which of these creatures has been on the earth the longest? We've got the bald eagle, the T-Rex, the dolphin, or the fish. Now, I'm actually not going to answer the question. Remember that. Put a string on your finger, whatever that means. Um, remember this question. And remember two answers, actually. What is your answer right now, sitting here? Which of those creatures has been around the longest? And then what might the answer be of some random person out there? You go to Walmart, you run into a random person, maybe they're not all that religious or whatever, and you ask them this question, what might their response be? Maybe your responses would be the same, whatever. But just think about what those responses would be. We'll get back to that at the very end. Now, if there were two sources of information to learn about a particular topic, any, any topic, two sources, what if you were only told part of one and none of the other? Could you come to the wrong conclusion about that topic? Yeah, you could. In fact, I'd be surprised if you didn't come to the wrong conclusion. Well, that's what we have with dinosaurs. We're only being told part of the science and none of the Bible. The kids are not sitting in class today and the teachers say, today we're gonna to talk about dinosaurs, so get your Bibles out. <laughs> that doesn't happen in the public schools. <laughs> Probably not even enough in Christian schools. We're getting part of the science and none of scripture, so you could very easily come to the wrong conclusion. And what's interesting is I have found that Christians not only don't know what they think about dinosaurs, they don't know what they're supposed to think. Like, I'm a Christian, what am I supposed to think? I don't know, I mean, should we deny they ever existed? Some Christians say that, well, yeah, they never existed, that's just a tool of Satan. It's like, really? <laughs> and others say, well, you know, they did exist, and they, you know, scientists have proved they're millions of years old, so I just, you have to accept that, and so I'm not quite sure how that fits in the Bible, I don't want to think about it, and they, go on with their day. They, they're not quite sure what to think. It's confusing, so they just go on with life because it's maybe not that important of a topic to them. So that's why we're talking about this. But then they say, yeah, but the Bible doesn't say anything about dinosaurs. And if the Bible doesn't say something about a particular topic, like the mass of an electron, 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms, which you guys knew that, <laughs> If it doesn't address something, you're kind of free to conclude whatever you want. If the scientists tell you that that's what the mass is, that's fine. We don't have a problem with that. The Bible doesn't say it's something different. But if the Bible does say something about the topic, 
That needs to be your starting point because it's in the Bible. That's what God wrote. And so everything else you learn after that has to comport with what the Bible says as its starting point. For example, if you want to know who the first man was, well, pretty clear. It was Adam because the Bible says that in Genesis 2 and 1 Corinthians 15, 40, 50, uh, 1545. Adam was the first man. You don't have any other options for that. The Bible is very, very specific. But if you want to know how tall the first man was, the Bible does not address that. So if you want to conclude that Adam was 6'3", I'm fine with that. <laughs> I guess why I, I'm guessing that. But the point is the Bible doesn't give us those details. So if he was 5'8", or 6'9", or we don't know. It doesn't really matter too much. Probably doesn't make sense to say he was 30 feet tall because that wouldn't work out with the physiology and all that. No reason to think he was that much taller. So here are some questions that we're going to address. We won't hit all of these, but these are the questions that I hit in the three-part series. Part one of the series, I addressed these questions. Why isn't the word dinosaur in the Bible? Uh, when were dinosaurs created? And were they really vicious meat eaters? Part two, I talk about how old are dinosaur fossils? Uh, did dinosaurs turn into oil? <laughs> did dinosaurs and man ever live together? Then in part three, we continue this question because there's so much to it. And then I address dinosaurs and human fossils together. Uh, is it possible to clone a dinosaur? Are dinosaurs really extinct? Uh, were there dinosaurs on the ark? And then how big were the dinosaurs? Those are all the questions that I answer on the three-part series. And we'll get to a good chunk of those here in the singular talk. And then oh, how many types of dinosaurs were there as well? Now, I have an interesting exercise for you, but it's not this kind of exercise. No one's going to get hurt or pull a muscle, hopefully not. This is a mental exercise. You're going to do this in your head. This is really interesting. Imagine I gave each one of you a blank piece of paper, and I want you to write on that sheet of paper everything you know about dinosaurs. Just bullet points. Might be one thing, might be a whole page full. You might turn it over and keep writing. Think through what you would put on your piece of paper. And then when you're done, I would ask you to take a look at everything you wrote and ask yourself, which of those things do you know versus, well, that, that's what I've been taught. Probably every single thing on that paper is not something you actually know. It's just you were taught that. Well, they, they died out 65 million years ago. Do you know that? I mean, well, that's what they say. You know, I saw it in a documentary, or my teacher told me that, or they were vicious meat eaters. You don't, do you know that? Well, no, but I've you know, seen teeth. They're pretty big. All those things. You don't really know that, you've just been taught it over and over and over. So it just seems pretty straightforward because you've heard it so much from so many different sources. But again, you don't really know those things, you just heard them a lot. Well, there's no shortage of children's textbooks and children's textbooks are one of the first introductions to dinosaurs for children and even to reading. It captures their attention. It did mine, I absolutely hated reading when I was young. But in a dinosaur book, I could at least look at the pictures and things like that. So uh, how many of you remember Danny and the Dinosaur? It's been around forever. Even young kids <laughs> raise their hand. This, this, is, this book's older than dinosaurs, I think. Um, <clears throat> but interesting book. And again, no shortage. There are hundreds of children's books on dinosaurs. But they introduce dinosaurs with a very different storyline or narrative than what Scripture says. And unfortunately, too often the churches don't really comment on it, so the students grow up thinking it must be okay because the church isn't really saying anything. So as an example, we have Dr. Seuss. I did like Dr. Seuss because at least the words rhymed, and this is what Dr. Seuss teaches us about dinosaurs. He says, I am the cat in the hat we have met before. Today I will speak of the great dinosaur. Dinosaurs lived on the earth long ago before you and me, so how do we know? It says, from fossils. Dinosaur teeth, eggs, and bone got stuck in the muck. The net muck turned to stone. These fossils are old. They are dusty and warm because they were made long before you were born. And then it goes on to say, not hundreds of years, not thousands of years, but millions of years long before you were born. So what is Dr. Seuss teaching us about dinosaurs? That they lived millions and millions of years ago. And that sounds really cool. I remember being in elementary school thinking that that was so cool. They lived millions of years ago. My church didn't teach that, but they also didn't say it was wrong. So I, it must be true. And I thought it's pretty cool to think about them living that long ago. Now, my wife likes to shop at Goodwill. I'm not really a shopper and I don't really care for Goodwill, but she, she just finds the greatest deals there. One day I was with her and I was just killing some time because I was pretty bored. 
I was just looking through the men's t-shirts and I pulled one out and I said, hey, Amy, look at this. It looks just like my t-shirt. She goes, no, that is your t-shirt and you're not buying it back. <laughs> <laughs> True story. She took it out of the closet and I didn't even know about it and I found it and she wouldn't let me buy it back. Even though it still worked, it had a hole for the neck, you know, and all that. Anyway, but another time I was at Goodwill just killing time and I thought, I know what I'll do. I will go over to the children's section where all the books are. And the first book that I find on dinosaurs, I'm going to pull it off the shelf and I bet myself the first page of that book that I've never seen before will talk about millions of years ago in dinosaurs. So I walked over to the book section, children's, and I saw this was the first book I saw. I bought it so I could put it in my presentation, pulled it off the shelf, and I bet myself that if I am right, I owe me a hot fudge sundae. <laughs> And if I'm wrong, I owe me a hot fudge Sunday. <laughs> so either way, it was going to work out well. Well, I opened the book, and this is what it said. Dinosaurs lived long, long ago, even before people lived on the earth. They ruled and roamed the land for millions of years. So yeah, I got the hot fudge Sunday. <laughs> Worked out quite well. And even on the back cover, it talks about that a little bit more. It says, millions of years ago, the dinosaurs walked the earth. So you just hear it over and over and over, every dinosaur book. So it's just, it's just true, right? It must be because it's, it's in the books. So you go to school, and again, when I say school, I'm kind of generically referring to our public school system. I know some go to Christian schools, some are homeschooled, but most Christians grow up in public schools. So you go to school and you learn about history. And you go to church and you learn about Jesus. And then you go back to school and you learn about science. And then you go back to church and you learn about Jesus. And you go back to school and you learn about dinosaurs. And then you go back to church and you learn about Jesus. <laughs> and because of that, you just don't know where to stick a dinosaur in the Bible. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> and I say you do not stick a dinosaur in the Bible. Why do I say that? Because it sounds like a problem, like, I don't know, can you, certainly can't put it in the New Testament, but can't really put it by King David and just, I, I don't know. It sounds like a problem trying to stick it somewhere. You don't stick dinosaurs in the Bible. You use the narrative and the history of the Bible to figure out when did dinosaurs exist? How did they get here? When were they created? And all those things, you do it backwards. So it's not this problem of trying to stick dinosaurs in the Bible. So that leads us to this question, why isn't the word dinosaur in the Bible. Well, I grew up with the King James Version. I still use it today because I've memorized so many verses, ver, uh, verses in it. I don't want to try to switch over, but I realize most people use a different version. I've got other versions at home that I will study from, but when I get to a verse I have memorized, I actually skip over it because it messes my, with my head. If I'm reading two different versions, I will no longer have it memorized. So I grew up with the King James Version. I think it's very, very, very accurate, but it sounds a lot like Shakespeare and it's a little bit difficult sometimes. But the King James Version was written a long time ago. It was translate, or it translated a long time ago in 1611. Again, that's more like Shakespeare. The word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. That's 230 years after the translation of the King James Bible. So you can't possibly find the word dinosaur in there because it didn't even exist when they were doing the translation. You won't find the word microwave in there or skateboard or iPad or anything like that. Just, those words didn't even exist you know, back then. So that's one reason why you don't see the word dinosaur in the Bible, but you do often see the word dragon. This word was used throughout the world, throughout history, to describe very large creature, reptile-like creatures that today we would called dinosaurs. So you do see the word dragon in the Bible, and I think many of the occurrences are referring to what we today would call a dinosaur. And here's the standard view on dinosaurs that we learned from the public schools. This is cover of Time magazine. Uh, it said, the truth about dinosaurs. Very captivating. So that's going to grab your attention. You're like, the truth? Like, well, I, you know, I want to know what the truth is. There was a subtitle on this cover that I could not believe they put on there. I'm thinking they did not think through this. Here's the subtitle. It says, surprise, just about everything you believe is wrong. So you see that like, why I'm wrong? Well, I want to know the truth. I got to buy the magazine and read the article. Wait a minute. Where did most people learn about dinosaurs? 
from them and their magazines, Time Magazine, Smithsonian, National Geographic, Science Magazine. But now we're finding out we're wrong about what we knew, which came from them. That means they were wrong when they told us. If they were wrong before, why should we trust them now? Why are they magically right now when they're admitting they were wrong when they told us before? They, they could not have thought through that, that title on there. So here's their timeline, basically. So they died out 65 million years ago, and then we started evolving from an ape-like creature about 6 million years ago, and in our modern form, we showed up maybe 200,000 years ago. That's a standard timeline that they teach in all schools and state universities. Well, the main point is there are millions of years that exist in between the death of dinosaurs and the, the arrival of modern man, meaning modern man and dinosaurs never lived together. That's their story. You probably all you know, heard that and learned that in school system growing up and seeing videos on YouTube and documentaries and all that. That's just what we're taught over and over and over. So when were the dinosaurs actually created then? Again, we go back to scripture. It's very important. This should be our starting point. If we really, really believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God and everything in it is true, it makes sense to start there. If you don't think it's trustworthy with the creation account and dinosaurs and the flood and other things, then I will give you my Bible and a highlighter and say, please do me a favor, go through my Bible and highlight all the things I should just ignore or not put my trust in because I don't, I don't want to waste my time. The problem is no one can do that because like, where do you start? Where do you stop? What do you base it on? I think the whole thing is true, cover to cover, every single thing in it. So this is our starting point. What does the Bible say? For in six days, Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh. God created everything in six days. What does that leave out? It leaves out one thing, nothing. <laughs> God, create, God did not say, I, God, created everything in six days, well, except for the dinosaurs. I mean, I couldn't have done that, come on. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says God created everything in six days. So we should logically conclude that dinosaurs must have been created in those six days if you're going to take the Bible seriously. If you want to trust some other source, that's fine. But when you die and you face God and look him in the eye, he's not going to be asking you about some paleontologist or carbon-14 dating or anything. He's going to say, what did you do with my word? Why didn't you believe me? That's going to be really the only thing on the table. So they were created in six days. Well, can we get any more detail than that? Yeah. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. That's on day six. The land creatures on day six. Guess what? Dinosaurs were land creatures. So logically, according to scripture, the dinosaurs must have been created on day six. If you have a problem with that, you don't have a problem with my philosophy. You have a problem with what's written in your Bible. So you don't need to argue with me. You need to say, God, you're just wrong. This can't be right. And I don't, I don't know that you want to do that. So dinosaurs must have been created on day six, according to Scripture. And we'll, we'll get further into that. We're looking at some science, too. So were dinosaurs vicious meat eaters? We're, we're going through a lot of this fast, trying to answer a lot of questions. People say, oh, come on. The Bible doesn't really even talk about dinosaurs. You can't tell me it even tells us what they ate. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, we can tell you what the dinosaurs ate because the Bible tells us. You go back to Scripture, we have kind of a, a menu given to us. Genesis 1, 29-30, And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with the seed of the fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heaven, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has a breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. All of God's creatures originally were vegetarian. Is that my philosophy? Was I there to see it? No. I'm just looking at what the Bible says. So scripturally, we should conclude they were created on day six, and they were vegetarian to begin with. However, that sounds crazy. Look at the T-Rex and these teeth. I've got a replica tooth on my table out there. It's about six inches tall. People say, you're going to tell me that the T-Rex was a vegetarian. That's crazy, right? Let's think about this further. Here's the skull of a creature that's around today. <laughs> Look at these teeth. That is the skull of a meat eater. I mean, it has to be, right? No, that's the skull of a fruit bat. You guys have any idea what fruit bats eat? They eat pizza. No, they don't eat pizza. 
They eat fruit. Just because something has large or sharp teeth doesn't make it a meat eater. Here's another skull. Look at those teeth. That's got to be a vicious meat eater. That's the skull of a grizzly bear. No, grizzly bears can eat meat. They can. But they're largely vegetarian. Here's another skull. Look, these are huge, massive teeth. It's just got to be a meat eater. Well, that's a hippo. And hippos are largely vegetarian. One last one. The teeth on this guy are really, really sharp. Got to be a meat eater. No, that's the skull of a giant panda. Pandas use a very sharp teeth for stripping bamboo or when they're pretending to play the flute. So, sorry, I have a really dry sense of humor. I saw that. It's like, I got to do this, even though people will just roll their eyes. So don't pull a muscle when you do that. <laughs> but again, just because something has larger sharp teeth doesn't make it a meat eater. We shouldn't make that assumption. Now, this uh, actually belongs to me. Uh, not the car, the picture. <laughs> actually, the picture's not even mine. I got it off the internet. Uh, I, I thought we were talking about dinosaurs and meat eating and teeth and all that. Here's the point. Um, when you're driving around in the summer, it can get really hot out, even here in Wisconsin. So what do you do when you drive around? put the air conditioning on, or I used to say, you could roll the windows down, and you guys are laughing. The younger people are like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, you can roll your windows down. In the winter, it can get really cold. <laughs> so what do you do in the winter? You turn the heater on. A car is designed to handle the heat of the summer and the cold of the winter. It's the same thing with God's creatures. He created them all to be vegetarian, but he designed some of them to be able to eat meat because God knew right from the beginning, before he even created anything, he knew Adam and Eve were going to mess up. That was going to bring death and a curse into his perfect creation, and the flood was really going to change everything. So he designed them to be able to eat meat, and he even tells us about that. This is just after the flood, Genesis 9, 1 through 3. So we're, we're almost 1,700 years after the original creation. And corruption got so bad that God says, that's it, I'm flooding the earth, I'm judging uh, the sin of mankind with a worldwide flood. This is just after that flood, they're coming off the ark, and this is what God said. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you will be upon all the beasts of the earth and every bird in the heavens, upon all that you know, creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. God's kind of saying, hey, remember how you guys used to eat plants all the time? And they're probably thinking, yeah, that's all we ate. God says, now you can eat whatever you want. You can eat these creeping things. You can eat meat. It's okay now. There was a big change of plans because of how everything had changed because of sin and the curse and the flood and all that. So were dinosaurs vicious meat eaters? I think some of them were. Not originally, but God allowed them to eat meat because of the sin and the curse, and he equipped them to be able to eat meat, including he equipped us to be able to eat meat. It wouldn't make any sense to say, go ahead and eat meat, and we'd be like, with what? <laughs> so God knew the changes that would occur, and he designed us and creatures to be able to adapt to the changing environment. So now he said it's okay to eat meat. Again, we just keep going back to Scripture, and a lot of Christians are like, I never thought of that, I never thought of that, I never thought of it. It's like, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot in Scripture. If we'd pay attention to it, you can learn a whole lot. So how old are dinosaur fossils specifically? How do they determine the age? of these fossils. This is fascinating. Fascinating and disappointing. <laughs> You're going to be pretty disappointed when you find out what they're really doing to come up with these ages. So I'm going to try to keep it fairly simple. It's interesting when we dig up dinosaur bones, they don't come with tags on them saying 65 million years old. Uh, the scientists have to assign a name for them, which is usually fine. And then they assign an age, which is not so fine. And we'll talk about that. So what can happen is they will discover some dinosaur fossils, and there's no question, these are fossils from dinosaurs. So good evidence for that. We don't doubt that whatsoever. And then they need to go to a laboratory with another scientist who does dating. So maybe a paleontologist digs up the bone and they bring it into someone who does dating techniques in the laboratory. This is interesting. The person in the laboratory asks, where did you find it? Where did you find the fossil? Why do they care? Just give me a date. Here's the bone. Give me a date. No, they need to know where in this geologic column, all the layers in the earth that they've assigned names to in millions of years, they need to know where in these layers that they found it so this scientist will have an idea of how old it's supposed to be. 
And she might say, oh, this is what's that, it's a T-Rex tooth? Well, T-Rex, let me see, they died out about 65 million years ago. Okay, so this is going to be about 65 million years old. So this is from the upper Cretaceous here. Dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. So we have a target now. We, we kind of know what we're looking for. That you shouldn't need that. Just, just date the bone. So this is what happens. They say that the bones are too old to date. We can't actually date the bones themselves because we know they're 65 million years old and there won't be any carbon-14 in them to date, so we won't even try. Wait a minute, you don't know how old it is yet. That's what we're trying to find out. But now you're assuming how old it is to tell us we can't date the bones. That's not science. That, that's a great bias, so they won't date the bones. Okay. Do they date some of the rock layer where they found the fossil? They're digging up, they find the bones. Do they bring some of those rocks into the laboratory to date the ages on those rocks? Nope. Because those are sedimentary rocks, fragments of other rocks. And you can't use radiometric dating on sedimentary rocks. So they're not dating the bone, and they're not dating the rocks that the bone was found in. They bring in a nearby igneous rock that was close to the layer where they found the bone. And you can do radiometric dating on igneous rocks. So they do dating. And there are multiple methods that they use to get the dates. So uranium lead, they use that method. And let's say they come up with 1.1 billion years old. <laughs> that's way too old. We know that's wrong. They throw it out. And then they use rubidium strontium. And it comes up with 103,000 years. Well, that's way, way too young. It must have gotten contaminated. We can write it off telling people it was contaminated. We had to throw that one out. And then they have fish and track dating, and it says 25 million years old. Well, it's getting closer, but it's still, it still can't be right, so they throw that one out. And then they use potassium argon, and it says 68 million years old. They're like, ah. See, we were thinking it was 65 million years old. Potassium argon says 68 million years. So then they publish that in the magazine, and everyone's so impressed. So summarizing this whole thing, did they discover a dinosaur in the fossil? Yeah, they, they did. There's no question there. Was it a T-Rex? Yeah, we could tell it was a T-Rex. According to their theory, it was expected to be 65 million years old. Yes, that's what they would expect. Potassium argon came up with a date of 68 million years, and wow, the public is impressed because they told us about how old it should be, and they verified it through radiometric dating. But you never found out all the dates they threw out that didn't match up with what they wanted it to be. That's not science. That's cheating. <laughs> but that's what they do over and over and over. I'm going to give you some scientific reasons why these bones cannot possibly be millions of years old. First of all, most dinosaur bones that we find, they're still fresh. Like a cow bone. They have not fossilized yet. Here's a secular source. Bones do not have to be turned into stone to be fossils. And usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil. Modern bones that fall into mineral springs can become permineralized or fossilized within a matter of weeks. This can happen within weeks or months. If they're 65 million years old, they should have fossilized a long time ago. So how do you find dinosaur bones? And most of them are still fresh unless they're actually relatively young. We find carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. I give lectures on carbon-14 dating. I'll keep it simple. Carbon-14 decays away at a certain rate that if you stood there long enough, let's say 70, 80,000 years, and you were staring at it, it would decay away and it would be completely gone. There'd be nothing to see or measure after maybe 80,000 years. It decays away at that rate. If these bones, are supposed to be at least 65 million years old, that carbon-14 should be long gone. It's like watching an ice cube melt, you know, no one can tell you that ice cube's been in the Sahara Desert for 18 years. It'd probably melt after five minutes, you know, it'd be gone. So there shouldn't be any carbon-14 in these dinosaur bones, ever. We find them all the time. <laughs> also, we have soft tissue and red blood cells in dinosaur bones. Now, you're all looking at me like you are sick and tired of hearing about soft tissue and dinosaur bones, right? <laughs> no? Oh, maybe, maybe that's because they just discovered it two days ago and hasn't hit the news cycle yet. Try 1995. Some of you were alive back in 95, right? <laughs> Some of you weren't. Um, 
they've known about this for a long, long, long time. So why aren't you hearing about it? Because they can't explain it. It should not be there. Biological soft tissue cannot last for millions of years. I'm going to show you something that very, 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 very few people on the entire planet have ever seen. You are about to see soft dinosaur tissue in the laboratory being stretched and snapping back. And then you ask yourself if this is really millions of years old. That's the dinosaur soft tissue being stretched and snapping back. Doesn't that look fresh? <laughs> it does not look 65 or 100 million years old. That's crazy. They found it initially by accident. Dr. Mary Schweitzer back around 1995, they were trying to get this T-Rex bone out. It was too big to take it out of the helicopter. They had to break it in two. They took it back to the laboratory and they're doing some cross-section analysis on it. And, and she's looking in the microscope and she sees something that looks like red blood cells. And she's saying, well, it can't be because this is a dinosaur bone. It's 65 million years old. So she did her test again a second time. And it looked like red blood cells and soft tissue. So, but it can't be because it's, it's 65 million years old. She did her test three times and then four times and then five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 times. And she finally said, this is soft tissue. <laughs> we can't get around it. And so what happened is she told the other scientists and they said, oh, we've been wrong about everything we believe. Let's go to church and worship Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> no, now they say there must be something magical in nature that could preserve red blood cells and soft tissue for millions and millions of years. They haven't found it. That's why they're not telling you. If you read anything, look for the word iron. Well, if there's iron in the environment, that could extend the life a little bit. Yeah kind of a little bit, not that much, and too much iron just destroys it all. They do not have an answer, so you won't hear about it. But now that we've seen it, we are now looking for it. They never used to look for it, and we're finding it over. I listened to a two-hour lecture where they showed example after example. It was a private lecture uh, with Logos Research Associates and myself seeing all these slides of dinosaur bones and soft tissue and hemoglobin. And all. Just, it, was, it was amazing. So anyway, very powerful evidence. These things were buried in a flood about four and a half thousand years ago. And now we even have DNA from dinosaur bones. DNA is more fragile than red blood cells. And it's still there. It's crazy. All screaming. These bones, they could be thousands of years old, but not millions of years old. Very, very interesting. Actually went on a dinosaur excavation out in western Colorado a couple summers ago. Uh, very, very interesting. I was close to dinosaur Colorado. I'd never heard of it. So that's cool. I had to swing through it before I went to the excavation. And I found a church that was called Dinosaur Bible Fellowship. <laughs> it's like, how cool is that? It's got to be a lot of kids at that church. <laughs> um, I was also close to Dinosaur National Monument just across the border into Utah. You know, I've seen pictures of it. I had no idea that's where it was. I'm like, I'm so close. I got to go. So I drove over there. I had literally about 12 minutes. <laughs> so I just took a bunch of pictures and then had to run over to the excavation. But it's the side of a cliff that's exposed. There are 1,500 dinosaur bones exposed in this cliff. They're all over the place. You can walk up to it and touch them. Uh, 1,500. What people don't know is there's actually more clam fossils in this wall and cliff than there are dinosaur bones. How do you get sea creatures fossilized with dinosaur bones? Unless there was a worldwide flood and the ocean waters are coming onto the continent, that makes a lot of sense. We'll talk about the flood more tomorrow. So here's me with my Wisconsin shirt on, digging up a Camarasaurus. If you don't know what a Camarasaurus is, it looks like this, 66 feet long, 44,000 pounds heavy. Uh, if I were standing next to it and wearing yellow, which I wouldn't, that would be me for scale. <laughs> and we were digging up this femur here, which would fit in right there. And again, why were we digging them up? We need our own bones to take our own sampling to do our own testing. We can't wait for the secular scientists to tell us what they're finding. They may not be honest about it anyway. So we're having to get our own bones, and so we've been doing that. We've been shipping them over to a laboratory at the University of Liverpool over in the United Kingdom. I was just over here lecturing a couple months ago uh, for the third time, fascinating stories in Oxford and London and all that. But um, another question. I'm going fast here. We're just scratching the surface, I want to answer as many questions as I can. Uh, did dinosaurs and man ever live together? I actually have absolute proof, not just the good evidence, but absolute proof that man and dinosaur have lived together. So, <laughs> younger kids don't get that. That's really depressing to me as my audiences are getting older. 
I'm losing a lot on, on youth, but anyway, no, this is kind of silly. Actually, secular scientists hated the Flintstones cartoon because it gave you the impression that man and dinosaur are around together when they say, oh, it's not true at all. But there's actually very credible evidence that man and dinosaur lived together. Lots and lots of evidence comes in different categories. We have cultural references, historical accounts and sightings, paintings, carvings, artifacts, and then fossil footprints. I'm going to go through a little bit of that right now. The, the full series I have would do all of those. But what you're going to see with the full series, I go through a lot of accounts of people saw this, they saw that, they saw that. What do they all have in common? They are all stories. Does that mean they're false? No, it doesn't mean they're false. Does it mean they're true? No, they're, they're stories. Someone 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago said something, and we don't know that it happened. They're a credible person, but there's no way to prove it. It's, it's a story. But there are enough of them from credible people with some strong backing evidence to, to pay attention to it. So we'll look at some of these things here. Start out in the Congo region of Africa. Uh, the natives talk about something named Makele Amembe, and they describe it as a very, very large saurop sauropod dinosaur. These are natives who have not been educated in our educational system to know you can't have creatures like that because they died out 65 million years ago. No one told them that these guys that they saw died out 65 million years ago. So they're just telling the scientists who are visiting them this is what they saw. Now, the scientists are surprised, but these natives, are, they're just very casually sharing that way back in the dense area where it's too, too dense to live, they were exploring back there and they saw these creatures and there's a lot more stories to that particular one, but I'm gonna move on to other stories. Mosasaur, we have fossils of mosasaurs from the ocean 50 feet long. Now here's a diver, but if I put the diver to scale, this would be the size of the mosasaur. So imagine swimming around in the ocean and some creature like that comes swimming by, it would probably frighten you quite a bit. It doesn't take much imagination to one of these creatures coming up out of the ocean and capsizing a ship. Many historical stories from ship captains saying something came up out of the ocean and cut the ship in two. I laughed, lost half my crew and all that. Many, many of those stories. Did they post it on you know, Facebook and, and YouTube and all that? No, they couldn't. This is 100 years ago or you know, 500 years ago. They're stories. They're accounts that have been passed down. So. We don't know what to think, but they're very, very plausible that it could have easily been something like this. When we have fossils of those creatures, we know they existed in the past. And then getting back to Scripture and their biblical references to the word dragon. 21 times in the King James you see the word dragon, and I think most often it's referring to something like a dinosaur. So here's, here's a picture of a dragon today. Now, we would think that this is just complete fantasy, makes you know for good movies and things like that, but something like that could never have existed. That, that's just a fairy tale, right? Well, take a look at Dracorix. This is a real creature. We have fossils of that, and then you compare it to that dragon we just saw. So I think a lot of the accounts when people are talking about dragons, they're talking about real creatures. Sometimes they've elaborated it over the years, and now it has 50 eyes and 30 wings and all that, but I think they're based on credible accounts to begin with, and more biblical references to dragons and to dinosaurs. Job chapter 40, verse 15, talks about behemoth. So again, God's talking to Job, but he says, Now consider behemoth that I made with thee. This is what he says about behemoth. He moves his tail like a cedar tree. He's the chief of the ways of God. He drinks up a river. He draws up the Jordan into his mouth. When you read that section of Scripture, Job chapter 40, starting in the middle, verse 15, ask yourself what's being described. I don't think you're going to say it was a caterpillar or a newt or something like that. The only thing it matches up with is something like a dinosaur. But some things like a large sauropod here, but it has some cautions here. Many of our Bibles have footnotes, and I think the footnotes can be extremely helpful, kind of helping clarify some passage historically what was going on or some word, what it actually means. I, I think it can be really, really helpful. We just have to keep in mind the footnotes are not the inspired Word of God. They're, they're extra commentary that someone has put in there that, again, can be very often pretty helpful. But it doesn't mean they're right every time. And I'm going to give you an example where my opinion is these particular footnotes are not accurate. That's, that's my opinion of it. And here's the example for Job 40, verse 15, where it talks about behemoth. It's a little blurry, hard to see. This is where it's talking about behemoth. And there's a footnote that you have to look at. And down at the bottom, it says, possibly the hippopotamus or an elephant. 
So when you're reading Behemoth, they are telling you it's, it's probably a hippopotamus or an elephant that God is talking to Job about. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't line up with the description. Here's the hippo. Look at the hippo's tail. Does that look like a cedar tree? <laughs> not, not even close. So some will say, okay, you're right. Yeah, you know, okay, it probably wasn't the hippo. It was probably an, an elephant. Now, elephants are bigger than hippos, maybe not quite that big. But elephants are bigger than hippos, but guess what? Their tails aren't really much bigger than a hippo. That's not like a cedar tree. It doesn't match up whatsoever. It matches up much better with something like a large sauropod. So we have Job down here at the bottom with um, maybe a brachiosaur next to him. So you know the story of Job. God allowed him to go through a lot of testing in his life. It was really, really challenging. And towards the end, Job starts questioning God. And then God says, oh, wait a minute, where were you? when I laid the foundations. Where were you when I stretched out the heavens? And then he says, Con consider behemoth that I made with you. I don't think that God is saying, Job, I know you've had a really hard time, but look at the hippo. <laughs> and then Job looks at a hippo and goes, oh, I feel so much better about my life. <laughs> I think that God's saying, look at behemoth. Consider behemoth that I made. He's the chief of my ways. I think Job looks 40 feet up into the air at the head, and he's like, I, th I think I get your point. Your God I'm not, I'm going to close my mouth now and listen. I think that's what's going on here. This is after the flood, a dinosaur that God is pointing Job towards to talk about God's own majesty. It fits in with the scripture, and there's no reason scientifically why that couldn't be either. We have more evidence that man and dinosaur live together through paintings, carvings, and artifacts. This is Kachina Bridge, Natural Bridges National Monument down in Utah, and you see this absolute beautiful painting of a dinosaur. Isn't that cool? Oh, you don't see it. <laughs> um, here it is, and I will outline it for you. They painted this. And I'll, I'll back up because I skipped the other slide too fast. This is Anasazi Indians, and they were doing their paintings between 150 B.C. and 1200 A.D., a long time ago, and they ended up painting this. How could they have painted that if they hadn't seen any creatures that looked like that? They could have just made up a creature. But there are so many of these things that makes a lot more sense that within their history they had seen something like it and they painted it on the cave wall. Havasupai Falls in the Grand Canyon. More beautiful artwork here. This is outlined so you can see it better. Looks just like another dinosaur, but painted long before we had dug up any dinosaur fossils or bones. So it's not like they're digging up bones, putting them together. All we know what they look like, let's paint it. We didn't even have fossils. We had not dug up any dinosaur fossils, and yet they were painting things like this. Then we have far north Queensland. This is a, de a depiction of a plesiosaur. Well, the natives there have a painting. They call it Yaru. It looks just like a plesiosaur. And there are natives running around outside of it. Some of them have spears trying to kill it because apparently it had eaten one of them. They have a picture of a native inside the stomach. So it looks like they knew what it looked like inside which would make sense if they had seen them and caught them and maybe cut them open or whatever. And this was painted long before we had any dinosaur bones or fossils. Very, very interesting. Then we get back to the United States, back to Utah, Utah and Black Dragon Canyon. There was a painting of something. This is uh, the stripes here, what they call the dragons in the rocks there. They painted this. It looks just like a pterodactyl. This was painted long before we had any pter pterodactyl fossils or bones. How do they know what to paint unless they had seen some flying creatures like that? They, you know, the, even the American Indians talk about the great thunderbird. That could be a reference to something like a pterodactyl from a long time ago that was passed on and, and painted things like that because they certainly didn't do it from, from fossils. And then we go to Cambodia. This is one of my favorites in Angkor Wat. There's an old monastery there. They had carved in one of the pillars this thing here. It looks just like a stegosaurus. This was in 1186 AD, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of years before we dug up any dinosaur bones. So how did they know what to carve unless in their history they had seen something like that? So there's many, 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 many more examples I have to skip for now. But uh, So where did the dinosaurs go? We're looking around. We, I'm not seeing any. Seems like they're gone. So if it seems like they did exist, but they're not here now, what happened to them? Well, I think 
it's largely answered by the flood. And I'm going to go into a lot more detail on the flood tomorrow morning in the session because the flood is so much more significant than most Christians think. You just think, oh, the Old Testament, you got the creation account and the flood and all that. Kind of, yeah, I kind of get that, but it's just, it doesn't really matter. It has no relationship to our life today. <laughs> you come back tomorrow morning, you're going to find out it is incredibly tied into your life today and everything you think about history and even, even prophecy will talk about that tomorrow. So I think most of the dinosaurs were wiped out in the flood. You know, were there any on the ark? Noah took two of each kind of animal on the ark and God brought the animals to him. God did not say take two of each kind of animal on the ark except for dinosaurs. He said take two of each kind and God brought them to him. So logically I don't have time to go into the details but Noah would have had two of each kind of dinosaur on the ark and there were maybe 50 to 70 kinds of dinosaurs. Even secular scientists say we kind of exaggerated how many dinosaurs there are. They'd find a, a skeleton and they'd say, oh, this is Nanotyrannosaurus, the new species. They got excited because they could put their name on it, claim they found it later. They'd say, no, it's just a young T-Rex. That's all it was. So, so they, they admit there weren't as many dinosaurs, kinds as they talk about. Easily put two of each kind on the ark and there's a lot of details of that that we have to skip. But back to this quiz that I asked you at the very, very beginning. Which of these creatures has been on the earth the longest? We have the bald eagle, T-Rex, the dolphin, or the fish. Now, think about what you were thinking. Your answer was, and the random person from Walmart. And what's interesting is most people, especially the random people, but even most Christians, would, it would be so obvious that the T-Rex has been around the longest. I mean, it's a dinosaur, right? But the answer is A, C, and D, everything except the T-Rex is just the opposite of what most people would think, including Christians. Why? You go back to Scripture. Scripture says God created the creatures of the water and the air on day five. That's the bald eagle, the dolphin, and the fish. The next day on day six, God created the land creatures. That would be the dinosaurs. So those other creatures were here first. Just one day earlier, but technically they were here first. But the point is, it's just the opposite of what we've been taught. So you have a dilemma. Are you going to believe what you're hearing from secular society, which is largely discovered by people that do not fear God? A lot of them don't even believe God. So are you going to just take for granted that it must be true because it's science, right? And then go to God's word to say, well, you didn't really mean this. You didn't mean six-day creation. You didn't mean a flood. You didn't mean this. You didn't mean that. I know better. Or are you going to say, you know what? Your word says you created everything in six days, land creatures on day six, they were vegetarian, the flood, blah, 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 all those things. And if there's a conflict, there's never, ever, 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 ever a conflict between the Bible and science. Never has been, never will be. But there are lots of conflicts between the Bible and scientists' opinions. Because <laughs> it's their opinion. They look at stuff and they, think, they tell us what they think about it. And they could be wrong, and they often have been, and they change their minds. That's how science works. We keep having to refine it and update it. So are you going to really, really trust the Bible and say, God, I might not understand all of this. I might not even like it. There's a lot in here I don't like. I really don't like it because it doesn't allow me to do what I want to do. But I have to say, it's, it's still your word, God. So help me do what I don't want to do. The old Romans chapter 7 thing and all these things that we want to do, we don't. And the things we don't want to do, we do and all that. Just, But I believe the whole thing. And I can't, I can't be obedient on my own. So I ask the Holy Spirit to help you obey that. So it's the same thing. When you're reading something, you're like, I don't know if I can believe that. Tell that to God. Say, this, this is a tough one for me, but help me trust your word and help me be patient for the scientists to catch up. And I have a whole talk I won't do right now, but it's surprise. The Bible explains that. And there are so many things that modern scientists are discovering that are confusing to them. But when you know scripture, it's like surprise. That's what we would expect. That's what the Bible says. That we came from one male and one female. I'll only share that one. Secular scientists are now convinced we have all come from one male and one female. That's shocking to them. They don't like that because it sounds too biblical. And then they say, well, yeah, this male and female, they didn't even live together at the same time, and it was long before the Bible time. Well, they've updated their signs even more. And now they realize, oh, I guess they did live together at the same time, and it wasn't that long ago. We're talking thousands of years ago. That's what we would expect. That's what the genetics actually screams today. So we just had to be patient for wait for them to catch up rather than for us to change our minds and follow them, follow them, follow them, follow them, well, just throw your Bible out and just follow the scientists. Why even use scripture? So anyway, I've got to uh, wind down here as I'll go on and on. We're just scratching the surface, but the whole point of this talk 
It's not dinosaurs. It's the authority of God's word. We need to trust it from cover to cover so you can in turn go out and you can win arguments with people and make them look foolish, right? Wrong. You want to strengthen your faith in the authority of God's word to then in turn go out and very, very graciously share the gospel message with people, knowing if they bring up tough questions, how do you know God exists? What about all the evil in the world? About all, all the contradictions in the Bible? Science has disproved it. There never was a flood, and on and on and on. You know that answers exist. Even if you don't have them memorized, you know you can get back to them. But you want to be confident so that you're not hesitant to share the gospel message, because they need the gospel message. They don't really need to learn about dinosaurs so much. So all my talks are, are focused on that, so that when all these social issues come our way, and we know there are a lot of them with transgenderism and gay marriage and wokeism and abortion and cancel culture and on, all those. There's tons of them. It should never be your philosophy versus theirs. You should say, because I mean, who are we that the whole world should care what we think about those things? You should just say, hey, interesting topic. Let me see what the Bible says about that. And if they have a problem with what you share, it's not with you. It's with God's word. And someday they'll be accountable for that. It's just for us to very graciously help them understand what the Bible says and to share with them why there are so many problems associated with these social issues because it goes against God's created order. God's not mean. He just created this universe to operate a certain way. And sometimes I tell people with a smile on my face, if you don't like it, that's fine, but you might want to create your own universe because the one you're living in now, well, it happens to be God's and He sets the rules and He's telling us if you don't do it this way, you're going to run into problems. And that's why we're running into problems. They're trying to do it their own way rather than God's way, which is how Adam and Eve messed up to begin with. So I'm going to close in a word of prayer. If you have questions, which there's probably lots of them, I'll hang around here or you can go to my table. You can always contact us through our website as well. I, I did want to share one thing really quick. I think I have in here um, a really quick promo that Nate, our camera guy, put together for us. Um, all, I already told you all of our videos are going to be free, so I've got the three books, but all the DVDs are streamable and going to be free starting next week. I want to really quickly show you a promo video. We can't get the audio to go through the speaker system. I'm going to try to hold the mic to my laptop, but it, you probably won't hear it really, really well, but that's okay. You'll see a promo for Grand Canyon tours that I lead. We're doing five this year, and the tours are all about the authority of Scripture. It's not about the Grand Canyon. You will learn a lot about the Grand Canyon. It is so unbelievably amazing, and you're going to see the best evidence on the planet for the worldwide flood, as in Genesis 6 through 8. That's what our tours are about. They're family-friendly. Five-year-olds go. We've had a couple, they were 80 years old. They, they loved it. It's just walking on a flat, flat pay path and just smooth sailing on a raft. It's not whitewater rafting or anything like that. So I'm going to play the promo video really quick. It's two minutes. If you're interested in one of our tours, we have spots available on four of the five tours. Uh, and you can grab a brochure, which we're running low on, but I'm going to print some more soon, or you can get more information from our website. So I'm going to see if, if the audio works at all. If it doesn't, that's fine. I can maybe narrate. Welcome to the Grand Canyon. You've all seen pictures. Come and see the real thing. Jay Sigurd here with the Starting Point Project to invite you to come along on one of our Grand Canyon tours where you will be on the top rim of the canyon looking down and you'll also get to be on the Colorado River. And all throughout our trip, we share scientific evidences that there really was a worldwide flood, just like we learned from Genesis 6 through 8. We know there was worldwide flood action, but not always the same way you see here. We want to take you from being in a position where you are praying and hoping that no one asks you about this flood story and Noah's Ark and all that, to a point where you're thinking, please, please ask me. Just learning about the creation theory and being able to really be equipped to defend that theory. A chance to learn a little bit more about just what God's done in the past and uh, his beautiful world that he created. The only explanation for the canyon is really catastrophic water action. Easy to understand, but yet profound. It helps me to articulate what I believe so much better. You'll be so excited about the authority of God's word that it can be trusted from cover to cover so that you can be more emboldened when you're graciously sharing the gospel message with those around you. The problem isn't the evidence because facts don't speak for themselves. What was your favorite part? The dinosaur tracks. Dinosaur tracks? Yeah, it's pretty cool. 
It's unbelievable. You have to see it in person. It is an amazing place to visit and we want to go on this journey with you, so get a hold of us to learn about the details of our trips, which you can find at thestartingpointproject.com. I'm gonna close with a quick word of prayer and hand it back over to, to Dave for the finishing the meeting. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time we've had to take a look ultimately at the authority of a word. I thank you for each person who took time to be here this evening. I pray that you would be greatly strengthening their faith and giving them opportunities to share the gospel message with a lost and dying world. And we just thank you for this time you've given to us and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What do we think, Jay?